Hola, me llamo Max Feinstein y soy anestesiólogo pediátrico. In this video, I take you through a day in my life on a mission trip in Mexico with Heart Care International, a nonprofit organization that conducts heart surgery for children throughout Latin America. This video does contain some graphic footage of medical procedures and surgery. Everyone who appears in this video, including parents of patients, gave their consent to be filmed. Finally, this video was made with the consent of Heart Care International and the hospital where all of the surgery took place. Before the week of surgery got started, we spent a night out experiencing local dance and marimba music. But we quickly got to work with the cardiology team, who had come to town several days earlier to evaluate over 40 potential patients using echocardiography to scan their hearts. Along with the surgeons and anesthesiologists, we identified the patients with the most time-sensitive heart conditions who would get surgery with us that week. Patient age ranged from several months old to teenagers. They were referred for surgery by cardiologists throughout southern Mexico, with many of these patients traveling numerous hours to get here. Their heart conditions ranged from relatively simple lesions like atrial septal defects to complex cases like pulmonary atresia and truncus arteriosus. During this surgical conference, the cardiologists presented echo findings and facilitated discussion about each patient's clinical status. Along with the surgeons, we put together an ambitious operative schedule for the week. Between two operating rooms, we aimed to do open heart surgery on 20 patients over five days. Every day started with a delicious breakfast at the hotel. My favorite was the chilaquiles, which were better than anything I can get in New York. Sorry, no offense. At 6.30 a.m., we head over to the hospital, which is called El Hospital de Especialidades Pediátricas, or the Pediatric Specialty Hospital. Inside the OR, I met up with the hospital's talented and hardworking anesthesia residents who had already gotten there before us to start setting up. For each patient we took care of, the residents hand wrote a highly detailed reference sheet with drug doses and clinical data. Simply amazing. Our first patient today is a one-year-old with a heart condition called Tetralogy of Fallot, which is a set of problems with the heart related to a hole between the ventricles. For the case, we set up infusions of fentanyl for pain control, tranexamic acid to reduce bleeding, propofol for anesthesia maintenance, and dexmedetomidine to help with heart rate control and sedation. While the anesthesia team got ready, the perfusion team also prepared the cardiopulmonary bypass machine, also known as the heart-lung machine, to support the patient during surgery. Warning. The following portion of this video contains graphic footage of intubation and open heart surgery on a one-year-old patient. Please skip ahead to 10 minutes and 7 seconds to bypass the graphic portion of the video. <laughs> Love a good bypass pun. The patient came to us with an IV already in place, so I induced anesthesia with a combination of midazolam, lidocaine, a high dose of fentanyl, and a low dose of the inhaled agent sevoflurane. I also administered the muscle relaxant rocuronium, which facilitated relaxation of the vocal cords, which you can see here. Thanks to the muscle relaxant, the cords opened up so that this all-star resident can secure the airway with an endotracheal tube. We then removed the rigid stylet, put a small amount of air in the cuff to prevent any leaks, and finally connect the patient to the ventilator. Next up, we'll get more vascular access to safely proceed with the surgery. I'll start by placing an arterial line to continuously monitor the patient's blood pressure and draw blood throughout the case. If you look closely at the ultrasound, you can see the bright needle tip entering the patient's artery. For these types of surgeries, we frequently need to administer medications that can most safely be given to a patient through a central line, which is a special type of IV that goes directly to the heart. In this case, the resident is placing a central line in the patient's neck with the help of ultrasound guidance to avoid hitting important structures nearby, like the carotid artery. After she places a short catheter in the internal jugular vein and checked to ensure it wasn't the high pressure carotid artery, she then inserts a long guide wire into the vein that will be used to get the actual central line to the right place. You can see that the wire tickles the heart a little bit and causes some extra beats. We also check again using ultrasound to see that the guide wire is in the low pressure internal jugular vein. Before we insert the central line, which you can see here, we first need to make our hole in the skin a little bit bigger. This is done with a short dilator, which is inserted over the guide wire that we know is in the right place. The dilator is carefully removed, making sure that the guide wire stays in place. 
Next, the resident slides the double lumen central line over the guide wire and sutures it at the appropriate depth for this patient. With all our lines in place, we're now ready for the surgeon to scrub in and get started. As the patient is being prepped with sterile solution, I'll point out that we've inserted a thermometer into the patient's mouth. The patient's body temperature will be cooled during surgery and we'll use this warming device to help heat him up after the bypass run. Here we've got brain monitoring equipment, our ventilator, and the monitor where we can see the patient's vital signs. As incision is being made by the surgeon, it's crucial for us to ensure that this patient has an appropriate amount of analgesia on board in order to avoid a hypercyanotic spell, also known as a TET spell, which can happen to patients with tetralogy of Fallot and cause the blood to become dangerously deoxygenated in a very short period of time. As you can see, the patient's heart is beating and is full of blood, which obviously prohibits the surgeon from being able to open it up and fix the lesions inside. Therefore, I injected the anticoagulant heparin into the patient's blood, and this timer here is actually a lab test that shows how anticoagulated the patient's blood has become as a result of that heparin. This is a key initial step to putting the patient on the cardiopulmonary bypass machine, which, as the name implies, will route blood around the heart and lungs so the surgeon can operate on it. This cannula that the surgeon is inserting into the patient's aorta is the next step and will allow the perfusionist to pump oxygenated blood into the patient's body. Now you can see a separate venous cannula that will allow the perfusionist to drain deoxygenated blood from the patient's body. A second venous cannula will also be inserted, so this is a bicaval cannulation technique. While on bypass, we keep the patient anesthetized using a propofol infusion that is routed into the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. These are the roller heads on the bypass machine that push oxygenated blood into the patient and also power the suction devices on the surgical field that allow blood lost through bleeding to be reinfused into the patient. Perfusionists have an extremely important job and you can learn more about that career path in the video that I linked up here. Now that we're on bypass and have stopped the patient's heart from beating, the surgeon makes a precise incision into the heart. Through that incision, he will fix the ventricular septal defect that allowed deoxygenated blood to pass into systemic circulation. Here's an obligatory pan of the surgical instruments. No video about surgery is complete without panning through the surgical instruments. Now the surgeon has completed the repair and is suturing the incision closed with a patch. Once that's done, we restart the heart by flushing out the potassium-filled solution from the coronary arteries that we previously injected to intentionally cause a cardiac arrest. For me, it never gets old to watch the heart go from asystole into a normal rhythm. Sometimes we have to deliver a shock to facilitate the process, but it often happens on its own without assistance. Initially, the EKG can look scary with this tombstone-like waveform, but that typically resolves pretty quickly as any residual air and potassium-filled solution leaves the coronary arteries. We've got a little way to go before we have a normal EKG tracing, but this looks like a promising sinus rhythm to me. I asked the surgeon to just briefly show us the patches that he put in place. If we'll deal with our patch, main PA patch. The main PA or pulmonary artery patch goes over a separate incision that was made to fix the pulmonary valve. Thumbs up for a successful repair. This clip is from a different surgery, but you can see that we had cardiologists come into the operating room and interpret echocardiography to evaluate how the repair looks before we close the chest. Since the patient's hemodynamics look good being off of bypass and indicate a successful repair, the surgical team proceeds to close the chest using wires for the tough bone of the sternum and sutures for the softer tissues above that. You can see that a drain is typically left in place for a few days after surgery, but that will eventually be removed. Although it's necessarily a big incision, it should heal up quite nicely over time. Now with the sterile dressing over the incision, the drapes are removed. What I haven't shown on screen is that in the background, I've steadily been decreasing the amount of anesthesia while simultaneously making sure that the patient has enough medication for pain control. 
With his respiratory status looking good, it's time to remove the breathing tube and head back to the intensive care unit to start the recovery process. The ICU team plays the incredibly important role of post-operative management of all of our patients. As you can see from this clip later in the day, the team has clearly kept our patient as pleased as could be with the recovery process. While we can't ask this little guy about his experience, I did have the enormous privilege of speaking with a previous Heart Care International patient and her parents who drove in from 10 hours away to come visit. ¿A qué querías venir aquí? A ver, Daisy. A mis abuelitos y a mis tías. ¿Y a qué más? A los doctores. ¿Verdad que sí? Sí. ¿Qué quieres que ellos te hagan? Adivisar. <laughs> Daisy had Tetralogy of Fallot that was repaired by Dr. Carrillo, the same surgeon who you just watched operate. Tuvimos un problemita con ella, ¿verdad? Cuando nos dijeron que ella tenía un soplo en su corazón. Pero ahorita no se le va a atender porque estamos en la mera pandemia. Entonces, atenderla ahorita es contagiarla. Y me quedé nada más con mi niña sabiendo cómo estaba, con un soplo en su corazón, y que iba a necesitar una cirugía futuro. Pero que ahora nos mandaban a México. ¿Y ahora a qué? Pues es que allá es donde solamente pueden operarnos a la Daisy. Estuvimos dos años yendo con Daisy a México, a la Ciudad de México. Y la verdad, pues, es un esfuerzo el que se hizo, ¿sí? Pero no se logró su operación allá. Resulta que los doctores también nos dijeron, mire, su niña sí está grave. Pero la niña puede esperar. Hay otros niños más graves. Doctores, pero es que la niña se nos pone moradita de sus uñas, de sus labios... Su corazón le palpita mucho. Sí, está grave, pero puede esperar que hay más niños más graves. Eventually, they heard from a friend whose child was operated on by the Heart Care International team that they should take Daisy to be evaluated in Chiapas. Llegamos aquí a Chiapas. Fuimos muy bien recibidos por el hospital de aquí, de la localidad de Chiapas. Por el recibimiento de aquí de Chiapas, hubo muchos compañeros nuestros en la fe, en la creencia que cómo nos apoyaron, nos auxiliaron demasiado, sí, y hasta la fecha. Daisy's open heart surgery was very similar to the one that you saw in this video. After some time in the intensive care unit, she left the hospital and was able to go back home and live a normal life for the first time. Sí, ella hace su vida y no se le ve su problema, por el contrario. Esperemos, verdad, que esto sirva para otros niños, sí, Que vean que la campaña de estos doctores vienen a trabajar. Vienen a hacer algo muy excelente. Daisy, ¿hay algo que quieres decir a la gente para despedirte? ¿Algo que quieres que la gente sepa? Que venga. Que viene. A ver los médicos. Que viene a ver los médicos. Los niños enfermos. Los niños Fuerte. Fuerte. Para que ellos también vayan. También ellos para que vayan. ¿Cómo quién? Como yo. ¿Cómo vas tú? Bien. A ver tu dedo, a la cámara. Bien. Bien, los dos dedos, mi amor. So. Bien. <laughs> Heart Care International is a non-profit organization that's based in Greenwich, Connecticut, and has been conducting pediatric heart surgery mission trips since 1994. They conduct multiple trips per year to different countries, including Peru, Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, and the Dominican Republic. Their work depends on medical professionals trained in pediatric cardiac care in all fields, surgery, anesthesia, cardiology, nursing, in the operating room and in the ICU, perfusion, biomed, and more. If you're a medical professional interested in joining a trip, join us and your life will be changed. Equally important is your financial support. We absolutely cannot do this kind of work without generous support from friends and donors. To learn more, please visit Heart Care International's website, which is linked in the description below. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And a huge thanks to Heart Care International for making this trip happen. See you next time.